This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Bill, for that very kind introduction. Uh, is the microphone on and can you, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, great. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be here today to tell you about the last five years of work in my lab. Now, there's no way I can tell you about all the last five years of work in my lab. We'd be here all afternoon. So I'm going to focus on a couple of stories. And one of the real themes emerging from the research in my lab is the importance of variability in plant development. And I'm going to tell you two stories about variability today. And variability is something we don't often think about as biologists. It's something we kind of sweep under the rug. We do our experiments. We get a number of replicates. We take the average. We put the error bars on. We hope the error bars are small, and that's about it. Um, but I, the theme emerging from my lab's research is that the variability is actually really important, and we need to pay attention to it. So one of the fundamental, oops, maybe we should. Is that okay, Adrian? Is that okay with everyone? Or is it? Should we try this one? No, this one. Let's do this. There we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one of the uh, fundamental uh, characteristics of all organisms is their size. From the giant sequoia tree to the small flowering plant wolfia or the mouse to the elephant. And the organ size needs to follow the organism. So a mouse has a very small liver, whereas an elephant has a very large liver. A couple years ago in Science Magazine, the question of how do organs know when they've reached the right size and decide to stop growing is one of the fundamental mysteries in developmental biology. And fundamentally, organ size is really simple. It's controlled by the number and size of the cells in the organ. And so in theory, if you just increase the cell number, you'll get a bigger organ. Or if you increase the cell size, you'll get a bigger organ. Now, as probably most of you know, reality is nowhere near this simple. And we'll come back to that. Closely related species often have different sizes. Here's Arabidopsis thaliana flower, and here's Arabidopsis lyrata flower. And you can see that they have the same organs in the flower. But the sizes are quite different. So the Arabidopsis thaliana petal is much smaller than the Arabidopsis lyrata petal. And it's been said that size is the material that evolution largely works on. But the field's really in the dark about how this happens. We don't know the mechanisms of how size changes. But since it's worked on by evolution, it means that there has to be some genetic control, which gives us a handle to get in here. Within a single species, size is very consistent. So these are Arabidopsis thaliana petals, and you can see they're all the same size and shape. And so when we're thinking about plants, we think about organs like floral organs as petals, sepals, stamens, carpels. So one of the fundamental questions is how do organs form with a reproducible size and shape? And this is a very uh, broad question. It applies to us humans, and it applies to plants. So as humans, you can think about your two arms. Your two arms are the same length. Uh, with a precision of 0 0.02. And if you think about when you're developing, when you're a smi small child, your arms are also the same length. And then as you become an adult, they grow. And throughout that period, they maintain the same length. The same thing is true in plants in sepals. So the sepal is the outermost green leaf-like floral organ. And the first thing the sepal does is grow and protect the floral meristem and the developing reproductive in organs inside the flower. And there are four sepals on each Arabidopsis flower. And those four sepals have to be the same size to enclose the flower and protect the bud. And it's the same with humans. They start out very small. And they have to maintain the same size throughout their growth as the flower is developing from the young sepals here in the middle to the older sepals out here um, to maintain this closure and protection. And here's four sepals from a flower. You can see they're really very similar size and shape. What makes the reproducibility of organ size particularly mysterious is the finding in many organisms that cells are highly variable. And if we take sepals as an example, sepals have highly variable cell size. They've got this beautiful pattern of giant cells, which I've false colored here in red, interspersed between a whole range of smaller cell sizes. 
So there's a ton of variability in cell size. There's also a ton of variability in growth rates. So here I'm showing you a heat map of a young developing sepal. And I'm going to show you a bunch of heat maps throughout the talk. In this case, red is growing fast and blue is growing slow. So you can see there's a ton of variability in these cells and their growth rates. You've got cells that are growing fast right next to cells that are growing very slowly. And if we think about plant cells, their growth is regulated by the cell wall mechanics and the turgor pressure inside. And so we also have looked at cell wall mechanics and find that they're highly variable as well. So in collaboration with Arezki Boudoud and Mathilde Dumont, uh, we did atomic force microscopy to look at the cell wall mechanics cool properties. So here's another heat map. In this case, red is stiff and blue is soft. And we've traced the outlines of the cells here in black over the AFM data, and you can see that we've got soft, stiff patches right next to soft patches. So there's a ton of variability in the cell wall properties as well. So at the cellular level and even subcellular level, we see a ton of variability. How do we go from this cellular variability to get regular organs? And the Arabidopsis sepal is a particularly good model system for looking at this question, um, particularly because it's relatively invariant to environmental fluctuations. Now, in the future, of course, we want to understand how the environment actually regulates growth. But to start, we need to understand growth to begin with without the input of the environment. So floral organs are relatively invariant to the environment. Uh, the flower is also particularly good because it has four sepals, and that allows us to compare organ size within a single flower. In addition, there's 60 to 100 se flowers per plant, so we can really get a statistical analysis of sepal size within a single plant. And finally, it's accessible for live imaging and manipulation. And one of the experiments that we love to do in my lab is live imaging. So we take our living plant, attach it to a slide, stuff it under the confocal microscope, and take an image. And then we put it back in the growth chamber, let it grow for another 6, 8, 12 hours, depending on the experiment and then it put it back on the microscope and image the same sepal again. And here's just an example of a few cells. We've got the nuclei marked in gold, and the plasma memories are really faint, and they're also in gold. And you can see there's three cells here. And six hours later, this cell has divided to make two cells here. This cell has divided to make these two cells. And this cell has just grown. So we can track what's going on in each of the cells over time. So here's an example of that live imaging. You can see the sepal is growing tremendously. The nuclei are moving around. Um, some cells are dividing. And in collaboration with Gerardo Tariello and Petros Komozakos, uh, we developed a method for tracking the cell lineages, so tracking each cell and all of its descendants. We've colored each uh, cell and its descendants by the same color. And you can see here that this giant cell that formed never went and underwent any divisions. It's all one cell. And this purple patch here went through a lot of divisions, so there's many cells. Uh, we incorporated this into the morphographic software package that Richard Smith developed. And this has been published in eLife as part of the morphographic software package. So the main question is, how does cellular variability give rise to organ regularity? And there's two sides of this question that I'm going to look at today. The first is, what mechanisms generate the cellular variability? And this is the work of my graduate student, Heather Meyer, who just defended her PhD. And the second question is, how do variable cells produce uniform organs? And this is the work of my postdoc, Dr. Leland Hong. OK, so let's start with this first question. How do we get this cell variability? And we want to look at this as a typical patterning question and ask particularly about giant cells. How do we get the pattern of giant cells interspersed between small cells? And so if we think about this in a developmental patterning setting, we think about we've got a small immature sepal primordium where the cells are all uniform. They're all the same. And how does a single cell decide it's going to, to become a giant cell or it's going to become a small cell? So everyone always asks me, what's the purpose of giant cells? They have an effect on organ curvature. So in a wild type sepal, we've got interspersed giant cells. And the sepals straighten up when the flower blooms and protect the base. If we have plants with too many giant cells, then the sepals splay outward. 
and they open up too early, so that developing flower bud is not protected, and it's not protecting the base here either. If we have sepals with no giant cells, they have a very subtle inward curvature defect. They're curved too much inward, they're not straightening up as the flower blooms to sit nicely along the base of the flower. And if we have a double mutant that loses giant cells, then the sepals start to roll up on themselves. You can see it's, it's completely rolling up. And because of this, it's not protecting the flower very well either. So giant cells have a role in sepal curvature. Uh, we've previously shown that giant cells form through a specialized cell cycle called endoreduplication. During the normal cell cycle, cells grow in G1, replicate their DNA in S phase, grow in G2, and then divide in M phase and keep on going through the cell cycle. During endoreduplication, cells exit the mitotic cell cycle and grow, replicate their DNA and grow, and keep on growing and replicating their DNA, becoming enlarged and polyploid. And so that's how you get these big giant cells. <coughs> If we measure DNA content using flow cytometry to measure how many endocycles it's undergone, we can see we have two C diploid cells. That's the starting point. They replicate their DNA once to 4C, twice to 8C, three times to 16C, or four times to 32C. And so it's these 16C and 32C cells that are the giant cells. And if we look at the relationship between DNA content and cell area, or we find that it's linearly correlated. So the giant cells are the 16C cells. And from our previous live imaging data, we've seen how these giant cells form. Um, so if we take two, and I'm going to show you a very simplified model here. If we take two C diploid cells in our sepal primordium, they replicate their DNA to 4C during the cell cycle. If these two divide, they go back to being 2C diploid cells, whereas if this one endoreduplicates, it becomes a 4C cell. Now, once a cell endoreduplicates, it generally cannot go back and divide again, so it's going to endoreduplicate again. So this 4C cell endoreduplicates to be an 8C cell. This cell maybe decides to endoreduplicate and become a 4C cell, and the rest of the cells might decide to divide. In the next cell cycle, this 8C cell is going to become a 16C giant cell. This 4C cell is going to become an 8C cell. Maybe this cell endoreduplicates to become a 4C cell and the rest divide. So what you can see here is that the pattern of cell sizes develops just based on the time at which each cell decides to endoreduplicate. If it decides to endoreduplicate very early, it becomes very enlarged and becomes a giant cell. If it endoreduplicates late, it does not. OK, so we've got one answer to our question. How do we get this variability? It's by variability in the timing of endoreduplication. But it still leaves us with another question. How does an individual cell decide whether it's going to divide and become small or endoreduplicate and become large? So to start to get at this question, when I was a postdoc, I started a mutant screen and we finished this mutant screen in my lab looking for mutants that affect giant cell formation. And we've pulled out quite a number of mutants. Uh, one is a cell cycle regulator that we'll come back to. There's a number of mutants in the epidermal specification pathway. This was quite a surprise. And there was one mutant with ectopic giant cells. It's involved in subcellular trafficking. And this was the work of my first graduate student, Xian, and he published a nice plant physiology paper on that. But today I want to focus on the ATML1 gene and ATML1 mutant. You can see the ATML1 mutant completely lacks giant cells. ATML1 encodes a homeodomain leucine zipper transcription factor, and it's involved in epidermal specification. So here's the protein structure. You've got a homeodomain, a leucine zipper domain, and a star domain. Uh, ATML1 is expressed throughout the epidermis, including in young sepals. So here's, here's a young sepal. You can see it's expressed in all that outer layer of cells. Uh, ATML1 is well known for its role in epidermal specification based on the work of Abhi et al., who found that ATML mutations in ATML1 and its sister gene, PDF2, cause a loss of epidermal identity. So in wild type, we've got a scanning electron micrograph and we're looking down on the surface. And you can see here's the epidermis, and it's been peeled back to reveal the mesophyll cells underneath. And the ATML1 PDF2 double mutant, the poor plant has its mesophyll exposed. There's no epidermis overlying it. And what's amazing is that those plants will actually germinate on soil, but then they desiccate and croak. <laughs> it's pretty bad not to have an epidermis. 
Conversely, if you overexpress ATML1 throughout all the cell layers, then you start to get epidermal cell types uh, forming in the internal layers. Here's a wild type cotyledon, and you can see here's the epidermis, and in the epidermis there are these uh, stomata, which are stained dark blue, which allow for gas exchange. When ATML1 is overexpressed in all cell layers, you start to get stomata developing in the internal mesophyll cells. That's really toxic to the plant, and these guys die too. <laughs> so, dead or dead. Um, but the question we have is, since ATML1 is expressed in every cell in the sepal epidermis, how is it that it only specifies some of them to become giant cells? And so we know from the ATML1 single mutant, it still has an epidermis, and yet it's completely lacking these giant cells. And this is a question that fascinated Heather. And so what we have to ask is, what happens if we overexpress ATML1 just in the epidermis? So we're not overexpressing it in the inner cell layers. We're not talking lethality here. And we get this spectacular phenotype. And this is in collaboration with Rita Sen, Bento, and Gwyneth Ingram. These sepals are completely covered in giant cells. So just overexpressing ATML1 in the epidermis, just increasing the levels, is sufficient to make sepals with all giant cells. And that tells us that levels of ATML1 are really important in this patterning process. So Heather explored this further and asked the question, how do different genetic levels of ATML1 influence the number of giant cells? So I've just shown you that ATML1 overexpression makes sepals with all giant cells. If we reduce the level of ATML1 uh, by making the transgene heterozygous, we find still a lot of giant cells, but now a few cells escape and become small cells. So reducing ATML1 uh, reduces the number of giant cells. We can take this a step further by removing the endogenous ATML1 by crossing this into the mutant. And we can see that in that case, we still have ectopic giant cells, but even fewer of them. And final, the final test is if we look at a heterozygous mutant that should have less ATML1 than wild type, we should get fewer giant cells, and that's exactly what we see. So there's a beautiful dosage dependency of the number of giant cells on the genetic um, level of ATML1. Okay, so we wanted to verify this not just with imaging, but with another mechanism. So Heather did flow cytometry to look at the enteroduplication. Remember, giant cells are highly enteroduplicated. So we're only looking at the highly enteroduplicated cells. And we see a very nice gradation in the number of 16C giant cells in these lines. So the overexpression homozygous has a lot, and it goes down to the mutant, which has very, very few. Uh, what's even more remarkable is that the overexpression line actually increases endoreduplication. We start to see 64C cells with an extra endocycle that we don't see in wild type. So clearly, the dosage of ATML1 is really important we're controlling the number of giant cells in the sepal. But this raises a question. In wild type, where we've got some cells becoming giant and some cells not becoming giant, they all have the same dosage of ATML1. This is wild type plants. They've got two copies of the ATML1 gene. So there's a couple of possibilities here. Either the cells exhibit varying responses to the same ATML1 concentration, or ATML1 concentrations vary between cells. Now, to test these two possibilities, Heather generated an ATML1 fluorescent fusion protein reporter. So she's got the whole upstream promoter region. She's got the M-citrine fluorescent protein fused to ATML1 and the downstream 3' UTR region. And she transformed this into ATML1 mutant plants and selected lines where it rescues um, the wild type number of giant cells. This is really important because this tells us that this transgene is functional. So the ATML1 here is the only ATML1. It's making the giant cells. And it also tells us that this ATML1 is expressed at the right level. So what we see is going to accurately reflect producing the wild type number of giant cells. OK, so what, what do we see in this line? Well, we see that different cells have different concentrations of ATML1. So here's, here's the ATML1 fluorescent pro fusion protein reporter. And it's lo nuclear localized because it's a transcription factor. So what you're seeing here, are all these dots are different nuclei. 
And you can see that some have very high concentrations of ATM01, very bright, and its neighbor is a little bit lower. Over here, there's a really bright one. Here's one that's so dim you can barely see it. So there's definitely different concentrations of ATM01 in these different epidermal cells. And this is a point at which giant cells, this is before giant cells have been established. So this is before, before the specification has taken place. So how does one cell get a higher level of ATM01 expression than its neighbor? And this made us think about the fact that gene expression is stochastic. There's been a lot of studies showing that gene expression uh, fluctuates up and down. So we hypothesized that maybe ATM01 concentrations fluctuate in each cell randomly. And maybe this is the patterning mechanism. So if ATM01 is fluctuating up and down, if it passes a threshold, maybe that cell goes on to become a giant cell, whereas another cell that never crosses that threshold goes on to become a small cell. This fits with our genetic data. So if we increase the expression of ATM01, we're going to bump all this fluctuation up above the threshold, and now everything's going to become a giant cell. In the ATM01 mutant, now everything's below the threshold, and nothing's going to become a giant cell because there's no ATM01. OK, so now we need to test this by live imaging. So Heather live imaged these ATM01 reporters every eight hours. And here's the. Here's the movie showing you the development over eight hours. Over, well, every eight hours, over many hours. And we collaborated with Henrik Janssen, James Locke, and their postdocs, Jose Tellis and Pau Formosa Jordan, at the Sainsbury Laboratory at University of Cambridge to quantify ATM01 in each cell over time and to create a model. So Heather actually flew over to Cambridge and worked with Jose on developing a quantification pipeline. And this is a real tour de force. So they take the raw image, they segment every single nucleus, um, which means detect each one individually. They take different time points and align them using ALT, and then can track the cell lineages over time. So we've got the 16-hour time point in red and the 24-hour time point in green. And if it's the nucleus is yellow, that means that it's the same nucleus. And if it's divided, then they track which one's descended from which. And measure the ATM01 concentration in the nucleus. And then put all this data together so that we can track individual nuclei, how their ATM01 concentration fluctuates. And this is just a hint, it does fluctuate. OK, so we have two predictions to be tested from the model. The first is that before a cell becomes giant, ATM01 levels should be above the threshold. And the second is that if a cell is going to remain small, then ATM01 levels should not surpass the threshold. And the key here is that this should all happen before the fate is decided so that it's predictive. OK, so here's what we see. We're, we've got all the cells in the sepal epidermis. Giant cells are in red. Small cells are in blue. You can see, first of all, that it does fluctuate. That's very dramatic. Uh, the, the second, the hypothesis is less clear, though. You can see that, in general, the giant cells tend to reach high levels of ATM01. So here's ATM01 concentration, high levels over time. But some of the blue cells actually reach very, very high concentration. So some small cells are getting way up here in the concentration. So then Heather thought about this a little bit more and asked, is there any cell cycle dependence? Because enteroduplication decision is probably made during G2. And so she determined the cell cycle by looking at the nuclear area. So in, this is a cell that goes through G2. It's large. It divides. G1 nuclei are smaller. Here's the graph showing the nuclear area over time. It's large in G2, divides to smaller nuclei. So you can use the nuclear area to determine the stage of the cell cycle. And throughout, I'm going to show you G2 in light blue and G1 in yellow. So let's take a look at a couple cells. Here we've got a cell that starts out in G1. It goes through G2. It's got very high concentration of ATM01 in G2. And then it goes on and enteroduplicates and becomes a giant cell. So we plot this on the graph, and we drive a threshold um, for ATM01. You can see that this cell crosses the threshold and then becomes a giant cell. Now here's another cell that has lower concentrations of ATM01 during G2. It never quite makes it past the threshold, and it divides and goes on to um, become two small cells. Yeah. 
Here's another cell that is above the threshold in G1, but it's also above the threshold in G2, and it goes on to enter or duplicate. Whereas this cell crosses the threshold in G1, but that doesn't have any effect. In G2, it's below the threshold, and it goes on and divides. So we're seeing a clear cell cycle dependence. If the cells in G2 and the HTML1 crosses the threshold, then it becomes a giant cell. So we wanted to uh, quantify this using receiver operator characteristic and find the threshold this way. So if we look at all the cells in G1 and we take the peak HTML1 concentration before it makes a decision, so the top one, we can plot it here. And you see we've got fairly overlapping distributions here. And if we do look at the true positives versus the false positives, it basically follows the random line. And we get a 54% uh, predictivity, which basically means we have no predictivity here, so not predictive in G1. Whereas if we look at G2 phase, so we've got, again, the peak HTML1. <coughs> you can see that now this uh, distributes better. The giant cells tend to have a higher peak HTML1 than the small cells. If we plot true positives versus false positives, then we get 82% predictivity. And so this one is predictive. So G2 phase, HTML concentration in G2 phase is predictive. OK, so in summary, we've got the HTML1 concentration in G1 phase doesn't tell us anything. But in G2 phase, if HTML1 is low, it's going to go through mitosis and divide. Whereas if it's high, it's going to go on and end or duplicate and become a giant cell. So we put this into a model. This is developed by Pau Formosa Jordan. So HTML1, uh, in every single cell, we've got HTML1. It's got a concentration that changes in time based on production. There's a production term, degradation degradation term, and a positive feedback loop that we hypothesize because HTML1 has its own binding site in its promoter. And it turns out in the model, we, it can work whether we have or do not have this positive feedback loop. So it's actually not necessary. And then we put stochastic noise into every single part of this equation. So everything is um, a little bit random. And so then we think that ATML1 must control some downstream target gene, given that it's a transcription factor. It's going to be act activating something. And that downstream target gene is going to regulate the cell cycle only in G2 phase to promote endoreduplication and inhibit mitosis. So we've got this cell cycle timer here. And it's just oscillating up and down to give us cell cycle time. But the behavior of ATML1 versus the target is really interesting because it produces a soft threshold. So the target has to cross a threshold uh, during G2 to make a cell under duplicate and become giant. It generally follows ATML1, but there's a lot of stochasticity here. So sometimes ATML1 will cross. So we've got ATML1 concentration target. If ATML1 crosses its threshold, but the target does not, then the cell is going to divide. Whereas if the target crushes the threshold, but ATML1 does not, then the cell is going to enter or duplicate. So that might explain this 82% predictivity we've got. We've got a uh, soft threshold here. OK, so how does the model look? Well, it looks very much like the data. So we've got HTML1 concentrations fluctuating up and down. If they surpass a threshold in G2, then the cell goes on and or duplicates. Whereas if the cell does not pass the threshold in G2, it's going to keep dividing and dividing. And even if it passes the threshold in G1, it keeps dividing. Here's the model. We've got HTML1 fluctuating up and down. We've got the target fluctuating up and down following ATML1. We've got the timer. That's just doing the cell cycle. And here we've got the cell size pattern developing. So we've got the ploidy. So again, the 2C is in yellow, 4C is in blue. And if it enter duplicates, it becomes red and then purple, then green. So let's play that movie again. And you can watch the ploidy and see that the cells are going to 4C, then they're dividing, going back to 2C. But then sometimes they decide to end or duplicate and become red. And then those cells end or duplicate further and become giant cells. So we, the model is developing a pattern of giant cells interspersed between smaller cells. So can the model reproduce our beautiful dosage series? Yes, it can. If we just vary the HTML1 production rate, we can get the whole range of different numbers of giant cells from all giant cells uh, down to you know, a few giant cells like wild type down to no giant cells in the mutant. So in conclusion, we've really discovered a new patterning mechanism based on fluctuations of a transcription factor.
HTML1 fluctuates up and down in the sepal primordium cells. And in the high state during G2, it promotes endoreduplication and causes the formation of a giant cell, whereas if it's low throughout G2, then the cell divides and becomes a small cell. And this is really fascinating because modeling has long predicted that there should be slight fluctuations of um, the activators of cell fate uh, to promote patterning. Even if it's a regular pattern, they need to be initiated by very small differences between cells. So here's a model based on the formation of trichomes or hair cells. And you've got the activators very slightly fluctuating randomly, and that sets up the regular pattern of trichome spacing. So we are now seeing m very much amplified fluctuations that are doing the patterning. So this is the work of Heather, as I said, and she just defended her PhD and the papers in revision for eLife. And of course, this is not the end of the story. We have a lot of future questions, which are what genes does ATML1 regulate to produce giant cells? And how do these genes respond to different concentrations of ATML1 to enact the threshold? And what about the other epidermal specification genes we found involved in giant cell development? Are they upstream, downstream, or in a possibly in a feedback loop? And Lila Luna just joined the lab, and she's working on these questions. And this is work funded by a five-year NSF career grant. And then we're also looking at LEGO. And I mentioned LEGO in the very beginning as one of the other mutants that doesn't have any giant cells. LEGO encodes a cell cycle regulator that's involved in inhibiting cyclin CDK complexes, and it promotes endoreduplication. And so the question is, does LEGO follow the predictions in the model for the target? And Dana is working on this. One prediction is that LEGO should be dosage dependent like ATML1, and that's exactly what Dana sees. So you can get the gradation from all giant cells to no giant cells by modulating the genetic dosage of LEGO. OK, so we need to come back to the question of organ size here and ask, how does cell size affect organ size? And this was our original hypothesis. But as you can see, the number of giant cells has absolutely no effect on organ size whatsoever. So you can go from very few, very large cells to many small cells. And the sepal, so here's sepal area, and here's the different genotypes. They're all basically exactly the same. And this is the work of Dana. So this brings up the mystery of compensation, which is well known in plant biology. When there some perturbation happens and there's fewer cells, they increase their size to get nearly normal organ size. Whereas if there's more cells, they decrease their size to get nearly normal organ size. So obviously, organ size is much more complicated. What we've seen is that the way this happens is in part because growth does not depend on cell division. So Gerardo and Heather published a very nice paper in Plant Physiology where they analyzed the growth of sepal cells. And so here's a single cell lineage. So we've got this, and it grows um, like this over time. And in each cell division event is marked with an orange arrow. And you can see that cell division has absolutely no effect on the growth. If we look at all the cells in the sepal and look at, OK, the red is all the cells. Purple is the non-dividing and reduplicating cells. And green is the dividing cells. And their growth curves are essentially exactly identical. So it doesn't matter if a cell is dividing or endoreduplicating, it's growing the same way. And that's how you get this trade-off where endoreduplication versus division does not affect sepal area. OK, so we have completely not answered the question of sepal size. So now we need to look at how do variable cells promote these uniform organs. And this is, a, again, this is the project worked on my, my postdoc, Dr. Leland Hong. And it's a question that fascinated an international interdisciplinary team of research, and we got a Human Frontiers grant to fund this work. So we're the biologists, and we work together with Arezki Budaud, Olivia Hamant. Um, Olivia is a cell biologist, and Arezki is a physicist in France. We work with Richard Smith, who I mentioned before, who created the morphographic software in Cologne, in Germany, and Chunbyu Li and Tamiki Komotsuzaki in Japan. Here we are all in Germany drinking five liters of beer, and we made it through more than one of those. <laughs> And as I said, this is funded by Human Frontiers program. So the question that fascinated us is the same question we've been talking about. How do you go from cellular variability to organ regularity? Well, as geneticists, if we want to know what controls a process, we need to disrupt it. 
So we need to find a mutant that disrupts the process. And if we want to know what creates regular organs, we need to find mutants that don't have regular organs, that have variable organs. So we screen for mutants with variable sepal size in the same flower. And this is a really novel screen. No one has done this before, screening for variable organ size in either plants or animals. Um, people have screened for bigger or smaller, but never variable. And it's one of the first screens to actually look for variability at all. There's been a few previous screens in yeast. And Leland found this spectacular mutant called FTSH4. And FTSH4 completely nails variability. It's got everything going on. So here's, here's our wild type flower. And it's got its four same size sepals. Here's three different FTSH4 flowers from the same plant. One is perfectly normal. One, this one has one normal sepal here and a couple smaller sepals here. You can see it also affects the other floral organs. And this poor flower has all four smaller sepals. If we look at earlier stages where the sepals in wild type close the flower bud because they're all the same size, we can see again there's some normal flowers and there's some flowers that are open because it's got smaller sepals, some normal sepals and some smaller sepals. So Leland quantified this to verify. Uh, we've got sepal area, and wild type has a very small variability in sepal area, whereas FDSH4 mutants have a much larger variability in sepal area. And so the next question is, when does the defect arise? Is this a problem in growth, or is this a problem in initiation? So Leland looked at very early sepal development. The sepals arise as primordia on the flanks of the floral meristem here. You've got the four sepals. They rapidly grow and start to cover the floral meristem, and they completely cover it and close the, se the flower. Here in FDSH4, the sepal primordia arise normally. They start to grow normally. And it's when they're trying to close the flower that you see, start to see problems. The flower's not quite closing. The sepal's lagging behind. It's not catching up. The sepal's lagging behind and leaving a gap. And again, another gap is forming. So the problem is not in the initiation, but in the growth of the sepals. So we wanted to think about this from a modeling perspective and ask the question, you know, how does cellular variability give rise to organ regularity? And we need to think about what we should look at here. And so we started with some modeling. And we based the modeling on our atomic force microscopy data, looking at variability in cell wall stiffness. So Resky and Mathilde made a model where they've got a mechanical sheet of tissue, and they put different stiffnesses into it. So black is stiff and gray to white is soft. And they replicate this variability based on the atomic force microscopy data, and then they see what happens. Uh-oh, we got a nose. <laughs> That's definitely not a sepal. And if we run this model again and again from different starting conditions, we never get a sepal out. We might get a drosophila wing or like a wing disc or something, but we never get a sepal. Um, so clearly, this model that has variability in space does not produce regular sepals. But then we thought, what if we make variability in space and in time? So the idea here is that each element is changing its stiffness in time. And you can see that sometimes it's soft, sometimes it's stiff, and that's producing very regular sepals. If we run it again and again, we get lots of regular sepals. So variability in space and in time leads to regular sepals. Now, these are pretty extreme models. This doesn't represent wild type or mutant. These are extremes. But they give us an idea what to think about and what to look for in the biology. And so in this virtual sepal, we see that cellular variability in space plus cellular variability in time gives us regular organ morphology. And the question is, is that what happens in the real sepal? Is this what's going on? So Leland did live imaging where she's watching the sepal grow. And she's got a plasma membrane marker so she can track every cell in its growth. Here's wild type. Here's the mutant, the FDSH4 mutant. You can see that it's having its typical problem where the sepals aren't closing because the growth isn't quite right. And so if she uses morphographics to analyze the growth in every cell, and we've got a heat map here with red growth, red fast growth and blue slow growth. You can see in wild type, there's considerable variability in growth. And in the mutant, it looks also fairly variable. So we took a very close look at the variability. And first, we know we need to analyze the variability in space. And so we take each cell and look at all of its neighbors and assess how variable is this cell relative to it, how, how variable are neighboring cells. And we do that throughout the sepal, and we get an average variability. 
And so we've got wild type plotted in blue here, mutant plotted in pink, and so going from low variability to high variability over time. And what we find is actually wild type is more variable than the mutant. Now initially, without the modeling, this would be a huge surprise. How is more variability giving rise to more regular organs? And less variability gives more screwed up organs. And you can see here's the average wild type. It's definitely above the average mutant. So then we know we need to look at variability in time as well. That's the next part of the model. So we look at a cell and how much does its growth rate change at the next time point. So this one changes a lot and this one changes very little. And then we see that wild type and mutant are largely overlapping. So there's high variability to low variability on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And you can see that the blue wild type and the pink mutant are mm, maybe the mutant's a little less variable, but they're overlapping enough that uh, we'll call it even. Finally, we looked at variability in cell wall mechanics, cell wall stiffness, using atomic force microscopy. And so we're looking at how does each spot relate to its neighboring spots in wild type versus mutant. So we've got variability here, and wild type is more spatially variable than the mutant. So again, the mutant has reduced variability. So in wild type, we've got high variability in space, high variability in time, and it produces regular sepals. Whereas in the mutant, we've got low variability in space, about the same variability in time, and this is producing irregular sepals. So we wanted to test this in the model. If we reduced variability in space, do we get more irregular sepals like what we see in the mutant? So here's our normal sepals with high variability in space and time. If we reduce the variability in space, and that means making each of these spots bigger, so that's what you're seeing here, bigger spots, uh, so reduced variability, then we get more irregular sepals. You can see these are not as regular, got different, slightly different sizes and different shapes, so that is much more like the mutant. So just reducing variability in space can produce more like mutant phenotype. And so then we um, ask, how do you go from cellular variability to uh, organ, regular organ morphology um, with the cellular variability in space and time? And Leland looked at the principal direction of growth, which is the main direction the cell is growing in. So if you take this green cell and it grows to be this red cell, it's growing mostly in this direction, so we've got a little line here indicating that. That's shown by the white lines here on each cell. And so over each 24-hour period, you can see there's quite a bit of variability in growth direction. That's what we expect. We see a ton of variability. But what's remarkable is if we look over the whole 48-hour interval at the growth, we see that now suddenly it's aligning. Most of these growth directions of these cells over 48 hours have aligned, and so that the sepal is growing much more normally over a long time. You can see how this happens. This cell's pointing a little bit um, to the right, then it's pointing a little bit to the left, and that averages out to point with the overall growth of the sepal. So cellular variability is undergoing spatial temporal averaging. This is a concept from physics um, that we're now seeing in biology to produce organ regularity. So what about the mutant? The mutant's variable and variable, but it doesn't do this spatial temporal averaging. After 48 hours, the directions are still highly variable. And it, if you go longer, it still doesn't average. So this cell is growing quite to the right. It's still growing a bit to the right. And at over 48 hours, it's growing a bit to the right. So it's, it's not averaging properly. So what causes the failure of spatial temporal averaging in FDSH4 mutants? Leland used um, positional cloning, cloned the gene, and found, much to our surprise, it's a mitochondrial protease. Uh, so this protease has an ATPase domain and a protease domain, and it sits in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, and it's a bit of a garbage collector. It's um, degrading unfolded proteins, particularly in the OxFos pathway. It can also help fo proteins fold, so it's, it's doing both sides of quality control. And it really mutates to this variable organ size phenotype. Leland pulled out six different alleles in our screen in this gene. FTSH4 is highly conserved across kingdoms. So it's, um, here's the conservation from uh, Arabidopsis to human to yeast to E. coli. And you can see in the protease domain underlined in red and the, or, sorry, the ATPase domain underlined in red and the protease domain in green that it's 
highly conserved. Um, so how do we go from this FDSH4 mutation generates mitochondrial defects to reduce spatial temporal averaging? Well, one possibility is increased reactive oxygen species. Mitochondrial defects often include, it cause the accumulation of reactive oxygen species, particularly superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. So Leland Stein, looking for reactive oxygen species, and she found greatly increased uh, super, uh, sorry, hydrogen peroxide accumulation. You can see it's very darkly stained compared to wild type. And she also saw superoxide accumulation. So here's wild type that's got a little bit. And here's the mutant. You can see it's got very early and very much increased and fairly variable superoxide. Some sepals are very darkly stained while others are not. So if it's the reactive oxygen species and the mutant causing the phenotype, then we should be able to reproduce the phenotype by treating plants with hydrogen peroxide. And that's, in fact, exactly what happened. When Leland dips wild type plants in hydrogen peroxide, she can get out variable sepal size, particularly these smaller sepals, just like the mutant. Now, conversely, if it's really the reactive oxygen species, we should be able to remove reactive oxygen species from the mutant and rescue it. And that's what happens. So if she overexpresses catalase, which degrades hydrogen peroxide, she can rescue normal sepal development. And I'll just give you a hint. These sepals look even larger than wild type. So how is ROS doing this? ROS affects a whole lot of signal transduction mechanisms, so it's probably doing a bunch of different things. But one thing that it could be doing is causing cross-linking of the cell wall. And so we looked at stiffness of the cell wall, and we find that, in fact, the mutant cell walls are, in general, stiffer. So here's a heat map again where we've got stiff in red and soft in blue. You can see that the mutant is overall stiffer than wild type. So this makes us ask, do reactive oxygen species actually regulate wild type sepal development? And when I looked at this, I was really excited because I saw that reactive oxygen species were accumulating in the wild type in a tip to base gradient as the sepal matures. And that reminded me of the growth pattern. So in young sepals, they're growing rapidly throughout, and then they start to slow from the tip at this blue slow growth, and it descends toward the base, very much reminiscent of this pattern. So we can ask, is ROS a mechanism of maturation? And to ask this, what we should see in the mutant is that the mutant matures early. And that's exactly what we see. So we've got wild type. You can see that it's starting to mature from the tip, just starting to, whereas the mutant is blue pretty much throughout the sepal at these later time points. So it's maturing early. So if ROS is really acting as the signal terminating growth in wild type, it should increase sepal size if we remove the ROS in wild type. So we take our wild type plants and overexpress either ascorbate peroxidase or catalase and we can get larger sepals just by reducing the reactive oxygen species in wild type. Whereas if we overexpress RBOHD, which is an NADPH oxidase, and produces too much ROS, then we get smaller sepals. So to conclude, we found that variability produces regularity, which is really kind of a remarkable thought. Uh, cellular variability undergoing spatial temporal averaging gives rise to organ regularity. Reactive oxygen species inhibit spatial temporal averaging and they seem to form a major signal inducing the maturation of the organ and termination of growth. So Leland published this in a beautiful paper in Developmental Cell. And in the future, we want to know how does ROS affect spatial temporal averaging at a more mechanistic level, following up on the mechanics. Uh, what mechanism produces ROS in wild type to terminate sepal growth? And what other genes contribute to sepal size regularity? So Leland's pulled out additional mutants, the variable organ size mutants, and is following up on a bunch of them. And I particularly want to mention the variable organ size 2 mutant. The, the gene encodes a MIB domain transcription factor. This is uh, being worked on by Min Yuan. And this one is really interesting. So here's wild type with its four equal size sepals. Here's the mutant. You can see variable sepal size. It's really interesting because it is affecting the primordium formation. So it's got defects where the primordium don't form normally, the sepal primordium. So it's affecting the other end of the scale. We saw FDSH4 is affecting termination, and VOS2 is now affecting initiation. So we're hoping we can put this all together. Uh, so just to summarize everything, we've got our spatial temporal averaging of cellular variability to produce organ regularity. 
we found a new patterning mechanism where fluctuations in ATML1 surpass a threshold during G2. That triggers endoreduplication via LEGO, and that leads to proper organ curvature. And reactive oxygen species inhibit spatial temporal averaging and induce the maturation and termination of growth. I want to mention a few other um, collaborations going on with SIPs in future directions. And so Dana is also looking at the relationship between ploidy, polyploidy with whole genome duplication and endopolyploidy and how that relates to cell size and organ size. And that, that's really an extension of our work in a new direction. And that's in collaboration with Jeff Doyle. And Joe is a joint graduate student with Mike Scanlon, and he's looking at asymmetric division in the MOS apical cell. And Leland's been working, collaborating with members of Joss Rose's lab, looking at the dynamics of cuticle ridge formation on the sepal, and there's a paper in revision for molecular plant. And Leland's also worked with Thomas Bjorkman looking at Ross in broccoli, and it looks very much like a rabidopsis that's accumulating the same way in the sepals. So I'd really like to thank the members of my lab. Uh, in particular, Leland did the work on organ size, and Heather did the work on ATM01 fluctuations. Uh, Xi'an was my first graduate student and did the work that I didn't have time to talk about in SEC24. And I've told you what Mingyuan and Dana and Joe and Lila are doing. This work's been funded by the NSF and the Human Frontiers. We have fantastic collaborators, particularly Henrik Janssen and James Locke and their postdocs Jose and Pau, and Arezki, Olivier, Richard, and Chunbyu Lee. And so I, I want to say that this is really the result of the hard work of my lab and the inspiration of their lab and their ideas all coming together. And so here's my lab over time. So I really want to thank my lab. It's been great working with you guys. And I look forward to all the future results we're going to have, which are going to be spectacular. And I also want to thank our collaborators. These collaborations are really intense. We meet every two to three weeks on Skype. We email all the time. These guys feel like lab members. I mean, we're always talking to each other. We even meet in person. This, uh, this one's in Singapore. And so it's been really great collaborations. And it's allowed us to do things that we couldn't do just as a lab by ourselves because we've got these different disciplinary perspectives coming together. I'd like to just finish by thanking Plant Biology and the Weill Institute for being my home for the last five years, and hopefully the future. Uh, <laughs> thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Is ATM1 more fluctuating than an average G1? Uh, this is, you must be our reviewer. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we have taken a small look at this, and what we looked at is SEC24 SEC promoter. And we looked at that because we had it available from our SEC24 work. And it, ATM01 definitely has more differences between different cells than SEC24. Now, that's exactly what the reviewers have asked us to do. They've asked us to look at different transcription factors. And Heather, it is currently growing a bunch of plants that have a look at that. But, um, I think either way it comes out, it's still interesting. I and mean, maybe we found a fundamental property that transcription factors are fluctuating all the time. Yeah. Um, as for the first part, you're showing the, the mini strain of the cell phase. Um, does the portion of cells, this portion of normal cells that undergo any transition, does it change through time or is it constant? Are you, so at the end, you might have a whole have more small cells, or fewer of them undergoing any So the, the pattern, yeah. So the, there's obviously a pattern in time of how many cells are entering into reduplication, and it is changing in time. Um, it's particularly complicated by the fact that at the end, we've got still model development happening, and those cells are not into reduplicating at all. So they start to undergo asymmetric division. So this is actually a key point, is that giant, if a giant cell forms, a stomata cell cannot form, because it takes the cell out of the patterning process before you can get stomata. Um, the rate does change in time. We've got some quantification of, of that. <laughs> yeah. Huh. We can look at details of it. Yeah. Does the periodicity of the cell cycle change for giant cells versus the regular cells? 
So we don't actually know the answer to that question. It's something I'd really like to know because one of the hypotheses is that endoduplicating cells may cycle faster. Um, the problem is we need a good cell cycle marker that still cycles in endoduplicating cells the same as in on endoduplicating cells, dividing cells, and we don't we don't yet have that, but we might have a lead on that. So yeah, okay. So the first question we'll do one question at a time. First question is, do other mutants that have ROS accumulation also lead to this variable phenotype? And this actually is a very interesting point. Um, FKSH4 is particularly variable because the RS accumulation is also variable. And that leads, what we've seen is that that leads to the variability in size in particular, but just ROS accumulation leads to much more variability in shape. So, in, for example, when we overexpress the NADPH oxidase and increase accumulation of ROS, we tend to get equally smaller sepals, but they have much more variability in shape. And what the subtlety that I didn't mention <coughs> in the model uh, when we decrease spatial temporal averaging by decreasing variability, we get um, we get more variable shape in particular. So it fits with this spatial temporal averaging having a key role in shape and a smaller role in size. Um, so it, it is slightly more complex, yes. <laughs> so the question is, is it necessary to have the downstream target also have a threshold? Um, we propose a downstream target because HMO is a transcription factor acting something downstream. Um, I don't know that it's necessary for the target to have a threshold, but it really does give us nice dynamics that look very much like our data with the soft threshold in HTML1. And that's really something we're going to have to test for the future, particularly whether LEGO has some kind of harder threshold like this or not. And the question is really, is LEGO the target or is it something else? And are there many steps between HTML1 and LEGO or not? We do know genetically LEGO is downstream. The, um, is it possible that the FTSH4 Ross effect is actually regulating ATML1 as well? I noticed that ATML1 has this start doping, which yeah. usually binds cholesterol, and oxidation of cholesterol is well characterized, and I wonder if we're regulating the activity of the transcription factor. So the question is, is Ross regulating ATML1? but very interesting hypothesis. Uh, so far, we don't see any obvious defect in giant cells in the FTSH4 being towards over-accumulating ROS, so we don't, we don't see a connection of the patterning there. The start domain is fascinating because, yeah, as you say, in animals, they often will bind cholesterol, and we don't know what it's actually doing in plants except that it's important. And there have been a lot of people trying to figure it out, and I'm hoping they're going to figure it out and let me because <laughs> it's been a big mystery for a long time. Yeah, I'm curious if you think of the ROS signal as being an intercellular signal, maybe like mosaics between FTSH4 and the wild type of signal belief that you actually see that effect. Yeah, that's another interesting question. Is ROS an intercellular signal or not? Um, what's thought is that hydrogen peroxide can move and superoxide can't, which also produces very interesting ideas. We have not yet tested that. You also seem to be one of our reviewers in one that we said we were going to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not trivial. Um, but it, I do think there is something interesting going on there. How much are each of these different species moving and does that contribute to things or not? So a good question for the future. Okay, well, thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.